How should one map out their studies, meaning what should one start with and how should they progress? So for example, should one study usul al-fiqh before fiqh also is it possible? If it's possible, can you mention some introductory text? So number one, the sunnah of the scholars is to always utilize local resources first. And this was actually a methodology that was passed on from the sadaf of the ummah, from the early scholars. And I remember when I was in Oklahoma and my teacher was from Senegal, who I lived with for 10 years, and he basically told me, you don't leave until I say you're ready to go. Nowadays, I don't think people are ready for that. I don't know if that's necessarily the style that'll work for this age, but I needed it because I was kind of a little buck wild kid. So it worked out that way. And then he told me that this is the way of the early scholars that you would try to utilize local resources. And what I noticed a lot of times is that as the scholars say, the soul is constantly trying to give people a sense of false reality, especially if it's not kept in check. So what you'll find is you'll have someone like Sheikh Majid in your community. And you might find someone's like, man, I can't wait to go study with the scholars, man. I want to go to Sudan and hang out with like the big baller imams. Like, who do you live with, dude? And who prays in your masjid every day? Right? And the idea of being delusioned is a fitna. So what I would advise you first and foremost to do is recognize local resources um, that you have in your community that you can learn from. And let these people, as you study with them and grow with them, give you a sense of trajectory and give you an idea of where you should head and understand that it's a long process. You know, our understanding of how to study the dean is very similar to like our favorite TV series that lasts for a few years and is over. But studying the dean, when I was in Ezhar, one day I was walking out of the university and I had this Malaysian friend who was in the College of Usul al-Din, the Fundamentals of Religion. And I went to him and he was like, Alhamdulillah, I graduated. So I was like, wow, subhanAllah, man, you graduated today, like graduation, mashallah, you know. And then I said, what's the one thing that you can share with me? Because that was my second year in the college. What's the, what's the one thing you can share with me that you've understood through the four years? And he said, I've understood how much I need to study more. And I've understood how much more I need to learn. And that this is a really long process, right, at arriving what I want to arrive to. So number one, you should utilize local resources. And I would encourage you to start with someone who can make sure that you're reading the Quran properly. The Quran, if you master brothers and sisters how to read the Quran properly and how to teach the Quran, then that's something you can pass on to your children. Wallahi, man, as a father. There's nothing more sweet to your ears than hearing your children read the Quran that you taught them. Because when you hear that, you're like, you know what, I can die now, man. Like real talk, like if I die, I know that every letter this child reads, inshallah, will be sadaqa jariya for me. And so you feel a sense of like, and there's actually a study in the Hoover Institute, by the way, not to get off topic, how marriage creates a belief in the hereafter. Because you learn of your own immortality by looking at your children and investing in them. So when you learn the Quran, it's like, it's like having a personal trainer. You know, people who go to the gym and they spend like $30 a month, like, I'm going to save money. They end up wasting more money because four years later, they're still out of shape, they're still fat, and all they've done is walk on a treadmill. You walk outside on a sidewalk. You don't pay $40 a month to go walk on a treadmill. Like, hello. Real talk, right? And then like, you know what? I should have got that personal trainer. So then they pay like double. Then the one who actually goes and gets a personal trainer... It works out with them for like six months because the amount they learn in that six months allows them to work out at home and even teach other people. And I've seen we have a brother in California who did this. So the same thing now if you go to a sheikh or a sheikha and you learn Quran from them and you learn Quran properly and you master the recitation, not resuscitation, you resuscitate dead people. The reciting of the Quran, people make that mistake all the time, it drives me crazy. To learn to recite the Quran properly, you're going to be able to pass it on to your spouse which is mustahab, by the way, and to pass it on to your kids. So I'd say start there. Number two, I would say that you should always read the seerah. At least once a year, we should be reading the life of the Prophet. The best book I've seen by far is by Adil Salahi in English. S-A-L-I-H-A, -A, called Muhammad Man and Messenger, or Prophet and Messenger. This, is a, this book, you read it, Wallahi, you'll shed tears. It's an absolutely joy to read, and it's free of any of the philosophical kind of battles. It's just, look, man, I love the prophet. Here's his life. 
And you feel that when you read it. Number three is if you're going to study hadith, you know, first of all, you need to take ulum hadith, and that's going to need a teacher to teach you al-bayqanuniya or, you know, nukhbat al-fikr or the muqaddim of Ibn Salah. We took the muqaddim of Ibn Salah for seven years, yani. So those are books I don't think you should worry about, but you should study, like I said, the 40 hadith of Nawi. Wallahi, man, if we just practice the first hadith, we're good. The second hadith, we're good. <coughs> and then Riyadh al-Salihin of Imam al nawi It's just an absolute important text to have. For studying Arabic, I have seen no one better than Abayna Institute with Sheikh Nu'man. <coughs> In order for you to have a basic knowledge of Arabic, functioning liter functional literacy of the Arabic language. You don't need scholarship. You know, Sibuwe talked about this. Khalil talked about this, how people, and Shatabi more so in the Muafaqat, and you know these people are, but these are our heroes, and we should know who our heroes are. He said that people have this false understanding when they study Arabic, oh, I want to learn all the asrar of the lugha, and you know, I want to get into like Ibn Jinni, and I want to read like the books of Ibn Hisham. That's not why you study Arabic. You study Arabic to understand the Quran, and to come close to Allah. And that's why I love Imam W.D. Muhammad, when a woman went to him one day and said, I have learned Arabic to make da'wah in America. He said, you don't learn Arabic to make da'wah, you learn Spanish to make da'wah. You learn Arabic to worship Allah, first and foremost. So I'd recommend that if you're able to get in touch with the Bayna, if not, there's a really good series called Al Arabiya Bayni A Day. And you can find someone from Muhammad bin Saud University. It's a great text, you can learn it, you can study it, right? As for studying usul of fiqh before fiqh, I actually teach usul of fiqh before fiqh. But that's to my students, like people that are really studying hard. And I usually don't teach people unless they memorize the Quran. I'm kind of tough. I'm fun and easy going, but if I'm going to teach you, we have to get down. Because I, I, you know, your, your sheikh is called your abat in the Quran, like your dad. Right? So, you know, there's a few students who study with me, but they are studying usul before fiqh simply because these are going to be imams. You know, may Allah make them, inshallah, imams for the community. And imam, we have sisters who won't be imams, but also studying what it, the knowledge of what it needs to be an imam in America. So that's my personal methodology. But uh, in general, I, uh, people usually teach, teach fiqh uh, before. And Imam Nawi said, you should prepare your heart for knowledge like you prepare earth to be cultivated. So understand that knowledge requires adab, requires etiquette. So a lot of times people want to go study the deen. I've seen in Egypt, actually it was Sheikh Rayyan. Our Sheikh, who one time was teaching the Muatta of Malik, and a Western brother stood up and said, this is a bidah, you don't know anything, I'm not going to sit in front of you like this. And he'd only been there for one year. Sheikh Ahmed Taha Rayyan is one of the highest leading legal authorities in Egypt. And I, was, I had to go and apologize on behalf of all American Muslims, even though the guy was from England, because they all thought we were American. And I said, you know, I'm really sorry that we have represented ourselves in this way. And he said to me, the problem with you people is before you come overseas, you should learn adab first. You should learn how to conduct yourself. Because you sit down when grown men are talking.